So we continue our explorations and uh, we started from the uh, Indus civilization, the first urban civilization on Indian soil. We continued with the question of the Aryan invasion. I remind you that according to still mainstream but increasingly shaky theory, the Aryans are the authors of this Ganges or Ganga Vindhya, to use the more current term, civilization. They are the ones who brought uh, Vedic culture, etc. So I will not uh, repeat the theory, but we will still discuss it a little further because uh, there are some points which uh, have been, um, what shall I say, re-evaluated in the light of recent archaeological evidence in the Ganges region. So I was confined the other day to the examination of the uh, Indus region. Um, then we will, of course, see some new developments, uh, which basically are the work of a uh, number of archaeologists in the Ganges plains. Um, this is a region which has received a little less attention than the Indus region <coughs> for a couple of reasons. The first is that, as you know, Ganges plains are still heavily populated. And uh, this is actually a major uh, difficulty confronting the archaeologists because, well, you cannot excavate a city like uh, Kampu easily or like uh, Varanasi. Uh, you need a bit of space, at least, to take a few trenches. And if you want to know more than the chronology of a site, if you want to, ex to bring to light uh, structures, uh, then, then uh, you cannot do it when there is a, a city over you. So uh, this is one of the reasons. Uh, there are others, uh, especially well, a lack of coordination between various universities and various agencies doing archaeology, but let's not go into that. <clears throat> Let us first look at some of the earliest developments before, long, long before we can speak of civilization. And <coughs> sorry, this is a view <coughs> of the middle Ganges plains, and you can see, of course, Kampur is here, Varanasi is here, <coughs> and we're going to see a number of sites. Uh, you cannot read because the, the, the type is too small, uh, but this is, um, what is it in fact? I think it's Hastinapura. It is Hastinapura. Uh, followed by Ahichatra. We will visit both of them. These are some of the sites we are going to, to view. Then uh, closer to uh, what is today, very close to what is today, Allahabad, you have Juicy, which is here. Uh, you have Koldhiwa, which is one of the earliest uh, Neolithic sites uh, which were discovered in India. And immediately <coughs> the dates when it was excavated, that goes back to the 1960s, if I remember well, the dates uh, went into the 7th and 8th millennium BC and people Scholars met them with great skepticism, but not anymore today because we have a lot of corroborative evidence at other sites. Then Tokwa, uh, Malhar, these are, of course, as you can see, all these sites here, this cluster of sites, are on the slopes of the Vindhyas, and hence the new terminology of Ganga Vindhya uh, civilization or Ganga Vidya set of cultures because it is many different. Uh, cultures, as we will see. <coughs> uh, Rajanal Katila, then uh, Lohra Dewa, in the other side of the Ganges Valley, not far from Gorakhpur. And uh, all these sites have come up with very surprising findings. So the first uh, very uh, uh, new development which totally upsets our understanding of the beginnings of agriculture in the Ganges Plains <coughs> are that at Juicy, Koldiwa and Tokwa, which I just showed you, recently, in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, grains of rice have been found and dated. Most of them, how do you, now, how do you date grains of rice? Very simply because the, the grains of rice which you find are charred 
grains of rice. You do not find the original grains of rice, they are long decayed of course, but when you cook, you know some grains of rice are going to spill into the, the chulha, the, into the, 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 the fire, and this is carbonized and preserved. And uh, because it is carbonized, it is also fairly easy to date if the sample is not contaminated. Uh, so it requires a bit of care on the part of the archaeologists, but when they are confident that the samples are pristine, uncontaminated, they can uh, get uh, dates through the, the carbon-14 method. Uh, in Lucknow, the Birbal Sahani Institute of Paleobotany has been not only identifying the precise species of the child grains, but also dating them. It has one of the early, um, earliest carbon-14 uh, facilities in India. There are more modern ones, but not yet open to archaeologists, so uh, we still have to, to make do with these uh, older methods, which actually require, they are, they are destructive in the sense that uh, you have to burn the entire grain of rice. The new uh, AMS uh, carbon-14 methods uh, are also destructive, but then they require only milligrams. So uh, the impact is, uh, uh, of course, much, and, and they can, give results much faster and they can actually uh, date hundreds of samples at the same time, which the conventional carbon-14 method cannot do. So you can see those dates going into the 7th and 8th millennium BC. And uh, this is not only rice, but it is doc domesticated rice. There's a big difference between wild rice, which you can still harvest you know, on some <coughs> roadsides, you may not recognize it as rice because it will be much smaller and thinner, but it is rice. And, uh, and domesticated rice, which through you know, long selections uh, of uh, um, uh, different species, subspecies, etc., uh, will, uh, will get uh, fatter and fatter grains. So this is very surprising because uh, if you remember perhaps some of your old textbooks, the previous dates were supposed to be in, in the second millennium BC at the most. Um, in fact, the, more importantly perhaps, is the fact that the, the previous picture of the Ganja civilization, according to the old Aryan vision theory, was that it was a kind of a virgin forest until the Aryans came about 1200 or 1000 BC and started clearing the for the forest with their iron tools. This is what some of you might remember having learned at, at school, and uh, some of your children are still learning this. And uh, therefore, we have an idea of a kind of completely uninhabited region until the coming of the Aryans. The recent research, especially by Dr. Rakesh Tiwari, who was still recently uh, director of archaeology under the UP government, but he's now the director general of the Archaeological Survey of India at the central government. Um, he uh, studied many sites across the whole central Ganga plains, and he found that in fact there were hundreds, 250 is only for the central Ganga plains, and that too is a provisional number, hundreds of rural settlements uh, going back into the second, third millennium BC, and some of them actually existing uh, since those dates which belong to the Neolithic time, when uh, humans have just settled in this area, settled uh, uh, in, in a sedentary sense, created permanent settlements, and uh, started practicing agriculture. So uh, this uh, completely changes our understanding of the Gangetic Plains, because uh, it was not, first of all, a virgin forest. It was more like a savanna landscape. The paleo environmental studies have shown that actually there were already large clearings. It was not as if the entire Ganges Plains were one single virgin forest, not at all. Uh, there were la no doubt much larger pockets of forest than we have today, absolutely no doubt about that, but there were also large clearings. So it is a kind of a savanna landscape, and within those uh, uh, um, openings, those grasslands in fact, uh, there were rural settlements practicing agriculture and uh, 250 of them, uh, as I said, is a provisional uh, figure, there may have been many more. So this is one uh, 
a couple of photos of uh, excavations in 2003 at Jusi, which is a kind of suburb of Allahabad. Uh, so you can see the mound here on the right, and you can see how uh, archaeologists uh, excavate gradually into the mound to uh, have a clear view of the stratigraphy. You know, the, what are the oldest layers, what are the uppermost layers, and this is what is called in archaeology the occupational deposit. You know, that is to say, uh, what, uh, what has accumulated through millennia of human occupation. So in this case, as I said earlier, it goes back all the way to Neolithic times. More views, and I believe this is a photo of Dr. Rakesh Shivari there. Uh, this, uh, what you see here, which may look puzzling to some of you, is actually a, a well made of terracotta rings. Uh, you may remember that um, Harappans had wells made of bricks, in fact trapezoid bricks. I'll come back to that in a future lecture. But um, uh, in the Ganges Plains, although a few wells of the same Harappan type have been found, people preferred to, uh, they, they actually invented this uh, technology. And uh, this, the advantage of it is that, see, a, a brick well has to be built from bottom up. And therefore, you should manage uh, a, a, a hole which does not uh, immediately get, get flooded or, or, or risks collapsing. But a, a, such a well with terracotta uh, uh, rings is built from top to bottom. You can just uh, stand on the opening and you keep sinking the, the terracotta rings from top and it will slide down. Of course, some workers have to go down and keep removing soil below the last string, but this is much, much safer than building a, 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 a brick well which might perhaps collapse while you are building it. So this method actually spread through the whole of India and uh, in the south, in Tamil Nadu, plenty of such uh, terracotta ring wells have been found. Uh, but uh, here, this belongs to the historical period. It does not belong to the Neolithic time. This is a much later period than what I was referring to earlier. <coughs> so then, <coughs> paleobotany is a very fascinating field uh, of archaeology. It's part of it. And it consists in understanding what people grew and eight, and also it gives you a lot of uh, information on what the environment might have been like. <clears throat> so often you will find similar species to what you would find today, <clears throat> but in some situations you find different sets of species that will, for example in the case of Harappan civilization, uh, that will testify to a, a, a more congenial environment, a wetter environment. <clears throat> so here you see some of the uh, species which have been identified uh, by, in fact, uh, Dr. K. S. Saraswat, who is emeritus scientist at the Birbal Sahan Institute of Paleobotany in Lucknow, and he's one of those who've done outstanding work in India on on all these, uh, you know, ancient species. So you have the Jawa millet, the til or sesame, green pea, linseed, mustard, all of these which are still grown today. <coughs> Uh, were already grown uh, in this period of time, between 2000 and 800 BC. So the environment has not drastically changed. But at the same time, there is something interesting going on, which is that uh, we see species penetrating into the Ganga Plains, like grape, pine, cedar, birch, all Himalayan trees come down. Ironwood comes from Burma, and from outside India, you have watermelon, and uh, you have dates. Watermelon, possibly from Africa, dates from the Gulf. And jackfruit finally comes up from the Deccan Plateau. So species migrate because, of course, people migrate. And uh, they, they, they carry those species maybe because the fruits are in demand or because uh, they, they have the seeds with them. But generally because of, because of a demand and because of the, the trade networks building up, and you can see, therefore, how you know, the, the uh, variety of flora available in a particular place gets enriched in the course of time. 
So these mechanisms are now fairly well understood. This happens here in the second millennium BC, eh? so between 1000 and 2000 BC. So you can, this also testifies to the fact that um, we didn't have to wait for the mythical Aryans, you know, to create all these crisscrossing of India and all these networks. Uh, uh, this takes, long, uh, takes place long before. Now, uh, Dr. Rakesh Tiwari has also proposed, in addition, that there were specific exchanges taking place between the Indus region, the Harappan zone, and the Ganges region. This is a new area of research. Many scholars have been proposing that actually Harappan, I, I showed you the other day, if you remember, that Harappans did not extend beyond the Ganges in the material phase. In other words, we do not have as yet any full-fledged Harappan settlement across the Ganges, only up to Yamuna and a little beyond. Nevertheless, there is some evidence, at least, of contact, interaction. So people were staying where they were, but you know they, 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 they knew each other and they were in contact. So here, uh, on the, in the Harappan world, we have various gold species, wheat and barley, which initially do not exist in the Ganges Plains, uh, pottery types like dish and stand, typical Harappan funerary type of pottery, uh, copper arrowheads, steel tight beads, you may remember some of those tiny Harappan beads, tiny, sometimes not so tiny. Whereas on the other hand, in the Gangetic uh, uh, world, we have rice, uh, and we have a different type of pottery called the corded ware, where you use a, a kind of a rope to give while the clay is still soft, to give imp patterns of impressions on the, so it's an easy way to decorate your pottery. So then what uh, Dr. Rakesh Tiwari proposes, it's not yet uh, universally accepted, but it makes sense, is that uh, we see the, the, the gold species traveling into the Ganges, the, the wheat and barley species also, various pottery, Harappan pottery types, copper arrowheads, and on the other hand, rice travels to the Indus world, and also this corded ware, eventually. But there is a question mark regarding the beads. Beads uh, do exist in plenty in the Ganges Valley, and these are some of them. Whether they were designed, patterned, on Harappan influence or not is still in dispute. It may also have been an independent industry. Beads have existed all over the world. It's, uh, beads are the easiest way to create ornaments, decorations. So it, they need not have taken place under Harappan influence, but there are some patterns which are surprisingly similar. So the question is open, basically, and this is a f very interesting field of investigation at the moment. Now, there are even more intriguing findings which paleobotanical study have come up with. And uh, I'll only give a few examples. Cortesi, the same Dr. K. S. Uh, Saraswat, uh, the first of which is the custard apple. And the custard apple, I think actually I'm limiting myself to this one example. There are a few more uh, which is brought out uh, in a few recent papers. And the custard apple, you know, all of you know the fruit, and uh, it is of American origin. There's no doubt about it for the simple reason that America has the widest number of varieties. And you know, varieties take time to evolve. So when you have a fruit uh, which has the, the largest number of varieties, you can be pretty sure that this is the place of origin. If you have another region of the world when you find only one or two varieties, then you can be certain that it has migrated there. So they are of American origin, and the conventional knowledge up to recently was that the Portuguese had brought uh, uh, um, custard apple into India. There's no doubt that the Portuguese brought a certain number of seeds from the Americas into India, and this was supposed to be one of them. But we have now evidence of seeds uh, in the, one of the sites I showed you, Tokwa and Rajanalaka Tila, and uh, in, in, uh, uh, you know, on the uh, Vindhya slopes, and those dates into the second millennium BC. So what exactly is going on is a big question mark because it shows that there were contacts with the Americas in, in those dates. 
The evidence is unmistakable. The question is what kind of contacts? And uh, uh, you know, on the other side of the ocean, in the Americas, there are also similar riddles. For example, the Mayans were using, uh, uh, were, were actually sculpting elephants into some of their uh, temples and, uh, and, and structures. And there's, no, there's never been elephants in America. So it, was, it has been well understood that there have been trans-oceanic contacts. The question is exactly when and through, through, through what agency. This is because we cannot, of course, propose that people were sailing from the Gangetic Plains all the way to, Amer to uh, the America. Or, 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 so there must have been ch chains of intermediaries, probably through Africa, probably. But the exact mechanism of it is absolutely not known as of now. So this is a very intriguing field of research, uh, which shows that you know some of our received ideas uh, do need to be challenged. This is a slide borrowed from Dr. Saraswat, uh, where you can see, in fact, uh, of various epochs, you can see the, those uh, remains of custom, custom apple uh, charred, of course, as I explained earlier. Uh, fr uh, from various times and various uh, sites. So this is how the, the paleo, one of the methods that the <coughs> paleobotanists follow. Now, uh, another uh, received idea which has been shattered is about the, our uh, dear Aryans bringing iron into the Gangetic Plains. This is what many textbooks continue to state. So remember, Aryans are supposed to have entered India about 1500 BC. By 1200 BC, they settle down on the banks of the Sarasvati. They compose the, 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 the hymns of the Rig Veda, even though those hymns which praise the Sarasvati uh, you know, are apparently addressed to a dry river because there's no Sarasvati left. But anyway, that's a detail. But then they penetrate the Ganges plains about 1000 uh, BC or so. <coughs> And uh, then they clear those virgin forests, as I explained. There were no virgin forests. And actually, iron existed uh, long before the supposed arrival of the Aryans, because we now have evidence. And this is, again, the work of Dr. Rakesh Sivari with various teams working under him. And also, the, occasionally, the universities of uh, departments of archaeology of the universities of Lucknow and Allahabad. They have also taken part in many of these uh, excavations. And you can see some of the dates here. You see Dadupur, 1700 BC. Uh, you have Malha here, 1800 BC. Uh, others are 12, 1100 BC. All of these dates are before the supposed penetration of the Aryans into the Ganges plains. Uh, for example, if I show you uh, excavations at Malhar here, uh, which uh, is uh, on the flanks of the Vindhya Hills, uh, you can see <coughs> some of the actual iron furnaces. This is an iron furnace where you, you have here also the, the opening for the tuyer. You know that it's a pipe that you insert and through which you blow air so that you can increase the temperature beyond what uh, the, 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 the simple charcoal closed in a chamber will give you. Because you do need higher temperatures, at least 1100 uh, degrees, to be able to smelt iron and um, iron ore. So, uh, so this is what they were achieving already uh, in 1800 BC. There are suspicions that it could be even 2000 BC, but uh, these dates are firmly established. And uh, again, well, as I just explained, it doesn't work with the uh, idea of the Aryans bringing iron to this region. You see here some of the tools they were making. These are needles. This is a broken arrowhead of iron. So, you know, arrowheads were, of course, in great demand for hunting, especially later on for warfare. And um, uh, to, uh, to, produce, to be able to produce them in sufficient numbers, iron is very convenient. Copper, bronze, as I explained last time, is a fairly, uh, was a fairly rare material in the uh, Indus civilization. It was not so widespread as iron became uh, here. The reason being that iron ore is very plentifully available uh, in the Vindhya Hills, even on the Himalayan slopes on the northern side also. Uh, this is probably a sickle, I suppose. This may be part of a chisel. I'm not very sure. 
So this, um, this iron production spreads. Of course, we cannot speak of an iron age from 1800 BC because by what is meant by iron age is an age when the use of iron becomes very widespread. And that really begins probably around 1200 BC or maybe 1000 BC. So there's a, you know, a little time lag uh, between the time uh, iron is first produced and between the time the entire region uses it as, as a, you know, as a uh, matter of daily routine. Um, then a few uh, interesting uh, points which were raised when the Ganges civilization was first explored was, you know, that the Mahabharata speaks of a number of sites and some of them have preserved the, the ancient names or rather <coughs> appear to have preserved the ancient names. So you have of course sites like Hastinapura which I pointed out, Ahichatra, you have Kampil which corresponds to Kampilya, uh, Mathura and of, uh, Koshambi is also mentioned in Mahabharata and so on. So uh, it's a bit difficult to imagine that you know none of these sites would actually have the original names. There must have been at least some of them which preserve the original names. And uh, in any case, the descriptions in the Mahabharata do match perfectly well all of this region, uh, including for the war itself, the Kurukshetra region. So when people started excavating, a very natural question was, well, what do we find there? Can we find something that could be somehow correlated to the epic? You know, it's, it's, it's a perennial question which uh, uh, naturally fascinates people, uh, but then the answer is not so easy as, as all that because what turns out is that, uh, and this is uh, for example at Hastinapura, this is a view of the different, you can see uh, various occupational layers going all the way to what archaeologists call virgin soil where you no longer have any trace of human activity of any sort you have just compact natural soil uh, which does not reflect any human activity. And um, well, the, the lowest, uh, this, this is the first excavation in the 1950s by Professor Bibi Lal, who is currently at the age of, I think, 92 or 93, uh, our Dwayan uh, among archaeologists. And um, well, he found that not only Hastinapura, but all of these sites, he excavated several of them, uh, associated with the Mahabharata, actually we're giving in the lowest occupational layer a certain type of pottery which I'm going to show you in the next few slides called painted grey ware. It's a grey pottery, very fine uh, and, and a very high quality which has painted motifs, so hence the name. Uh, but, then, but then you see the, there is a question of chronology, so this is some of the painted grey ware where you can see that people were making various kinds of pots you can, you know, they have reconstituted here what could have been pots used uh, for a, a meal, for example. And it looks as if the earliest, now the dates are a little hazy, unfortunately, they have, we haven't had enough of uh, rigorously dated uh, samples or rather uh, dated layers where this pottery has been found. Uh, this has been a kind of a chronic problem in the Ganges Valley. Uh, but nevertheless, we are pretty sure that uh, the, the earliest dates for this pottery should be 1200, maximum 13 or 1400 BC, not earlier than that. And um, this, therefore, uh, you know, raises a question because many people think or <coughs> take it for granted <coughs> that Mahabharata should be dated 3100 BC. This is the traditional. Uh, beginning of the Kali era. Uh, it doesn't seem to work or else if we want that Mahabharata should be in 3100 BC, 3100 BC, uh, we have to relocate the entire epic elsewhere, perhaps in the early Harappan sphere and then imagine that all of it was transferred to this region uh, uh, later on. But then it is a rather unnatural literary exercise. So the question remains open and uh, well there is no real consensus but archaeologists usually consider that what they call the Mahabharata era will be around uh, uh, um, this period, in fact more specifically around 1000 BC or so. However disappointing it may appear to some of them. 
So um, this is, of course, assuming that Mahabharata has a historical uh, uh, validity in itself, that the story, the main story it tells, is basically with, of course, due embellishments, uh, uh, which are inevitable in this kind of uh, epic, uh, a story which ha actually happened. This also is debated, and you know, it's very difficult to prove or disprove uh, any uh, uh, opinion in this matter. But um, uh, again, it would be rather unnatural to imagine that the entire story was made out of strictly nothing at all. There must have been, at least this is something that most archaeologists and historians agree upon, there must have been some historical kernel, you know, nucleus, around which the story was woven. So it's a very big question. I'm not uh, going to pretend to answer it. I just wanted to show you what uh, archaeology has contributed to the complexity of this question. Uh, Ahichatra, which is also mentioned in the Mahabharata as the capital of the northern Panchala, you may remember the story that Dropada was uh, Com compelled eventually to yield half of his kingdom to Dronacharya. This is the half which went to Drona. And Ahinshatra is a very important site um, in Bareilly district uh, today, which was first uh, uh, ex uh, not exactly excavated but explored in the 19th century by several scholars, Alexander Cunningham, who drew this map uh, in the 1860s, recorded you know, the fortifications, 34 uh, uh, bastions uh, uh, defining the rampart of the old city, uh, temples, uh, stupas, monasteries, Buddh meaning Buddhist monasteries, etc. So, uh, so this was the, one of the first, but recently, recently uh, excavations have taken place, which again have brought out painted gray ware. And in fact, much of the settlement which I've shown you in, in Cunningham's map is a basically a painted gray ware settlement and it, it covers an area of 40 hectares. Now this is a new question. You see, archaeology sometimes answers questions, but sometimes it ends up just putting more questions and um, uh, we have to be patient and, and uh, need much more data before we can answer them. This is the case here. If you have a painted gray ware settlement of 14 hectares, what is it? Is it a village? Is it a town? Is it a city? Actually, people are not even disregarding the possibility that, uh, contrary to previous thinking, painted gray ware settlements could have had some urban, a few of them could have had a kind of an urban context. But still, today, the dominant opinion is that they are basically rural settlements. Uh, villages, most of them, many of them are small, but some of them uh, as large as, you know, towns of reasonable size, like this one. So this is the research which recently Dr. Bhuvan Vikram of Archaeological Survey of India, in with some support from uh, IIT Kampo, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to show this, has conducted uh, IIT Kampo, meaning Dr. Onkar Dixit, Dr. Javin Malik, mainly, and uh, where a, a survey was done with uh, what is called a total station, which you see can immediately give a very precise map of all the, the levels and contours of the, uh, the settlement. Uh, this can be, these data can be visualized, integrated in the GI system, so all kinds of you know, manipulations can then uh, easily be done. And uh, uh, in particular, a GPR survey, that is to say ground penetrating radar, survey was done in a few places. Uh, this consists in sending, you know, waves of certain frequencies into the ground and uh, then capturing the reflected waves. And uh, this will give you patterns of what might be lying uh, down. I will come back to this question when we study the Ayodhya controversy. Uh, but let me not anticipate. So here, for example, to, just to show you uh, one of the new techniques, not so new in the West, but in India, uh, its uh, GPR has been used for perhaps not more than 10 to 15 years. Uh, so you will detect, for example, this kind of anomaly. Suddenly, you know, in, instead of a kind of a uniform uh, response which you will get from the underground layers, you will get something which is unusual. And then, of course, this is a very precious guide for the archaeologists because it can tell them where to excavate to find something significant. Otherwise, 
they may have also their own uh, clues through various hints that the topography will give them. But uh, this is far more precise. And here, for instance, what this curve which you see here was actually turned out to be a collapsed platform after excavation. So, so this is uh, what uh, Ahichatra uh, came up with. Uh, these are uh, some of the temples there, one of them to Shiva, uh, which uh, were uh, excavated earlier. And uh, in fact, I think I forgot to show, uh, let me go back briefly. I forgot to show uh, the, the photo I put on the frontispiece because these two lovely statues come from Ahichatra, uh, from the temple to Shiva. They are uh, almost uh, human-sized statues. You can see them in the National Museum in Delhi. Uh, they are made of terracotta, and you can recognize on the left Ganga. Uh, well, I don't know if you can recognize her, but <laughs> she is Ganga. And you, ha you have the crocodile here, the garial, the Gangetic uh, crocodile, which is a vahana, a, a, a vehicle. Uh, you, you, the pot, of course, here symbolizes the river, the water. And this is Yamuna again with the pot, and this is a tortoise, uh, which is her vehicle. So um, uh, it's interesting that the ancient mythology took care to take reptiles for their vehicles, which were actually reptiles existing in the region. Uh, today, of course, the garial is an endangered species. It exists still in a few tributaries. Uh, the dolphin, interestingly, is another vahana, another uh, vehicle uh, in the mythology of Ganga. And it's also a very seriously endangered species today. Uh, and then the, the, the tortoise is still quite, uh, quite common. So let me go back now to my... Uh, temples at Ahichatra, where these lovely figurines have come to light in recent excavations. Um, uh, the, on the left is, of course, uh, Shiva, and on the right, Parvati. So uh, what's interesting is that these sites have been known for a very long time. And uh, you know, uh, if the, the Chinese pilgrim Huan Sang, uh, in the 7th century AD, uh, had recorded already in his travels through North India the existence in Ahichatra of 12 Buddhist monasteries sheltering a thousand monks, so quite sizable, and nine temples to what he calls Ishwara Deva, that is to say, of course, uh, Shiva, with some 300 worshippers taking care of the temples. So this also is valuable data because, uh, well, we have now some archaeological evidence, not complete, of course, to match it with. Secondly, because also it tells us that both Hinduism, and we are here in the uh, 7th or 8th century AD, both Hinduism and Buddhism were coexisting uh, fairly peacefully, which has been um, um, uh, evidence at many other sites, like Nalanda, uh, for example. Uh, now, the question about this painted grey ware <coughs> uh, is important because we, we have seen that uh, it is found as a kind of what Professor Bibilal calls the lowest common denominator of the Mahabharata sites, that is to say, the lowest layer common to all of them. And uh, uh, it, 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 the question is whether this is a, a pottery which emerges in the Gangetic Plains or, if it, or whether it is intrusive. Has it come from outside through, through whoever, you know, Aryans or whatever else, uh, that doesn't matter. And uh, here we find, if you remember this uh, map, I showed uh, uh, more complete, this is a detail of it, of the end of the Indus civilization, where the Indus or Harappan sites in red have now totally deserted the central Sarasvati plains. And uh, you find them clustering along the, the Shivalik and uh, Yamuna basins, where water is still available. But strangely, there is still a cluster here, no doubt through an arm of the Satraj, which was in those days connecting at the, the old Sarasvati at this point. And what's interesting is that in the second millennium BC, there are not, not only late Harappan sites, but also uh, painted greyware sites in this location. So does it mean that the, the painted greyware has migrated from this region into the Ganges plains where you see them here, 
uh, we cannot answer very clearly today because the chronologies have not been securely uh, established. We would need you know, a, a resolution of something like a hundred years to be able to answer this question. And we don't have that fine resolution. But at various sites, like Dhaderi in Punjab might be one of these sites. Uh, Bhagavanpura in Haryana, which would be somewhere in, in this area. Uh, the late uh, Jagatpati Joshi had uh, found that Harappan, late Harappan and painted grey layers were actually interlocked, as he said. They, they were together at some layers. And uh, though people were skeptical for a long time, uh, recently at Alangirpur, which must be one of these sites here, across the Yamuna, I already mentioned it in my last talk, first excavated by Wadi Sharma in 1959, but re-excavated recently by a team of, uh, consisting of uh, Dr. Aran Singh of BHU and uh, some uh, uh, archaeologist from Cambridge University, uh, they found the same thing that uh, J.P. Joshi had found in uh, Bhagavanpura especially, that there, was, there were actually layers where both late Harappan and painted grey ware were together. In fact, these are the layers here. Uh, this is layer 7 in Alangyapur. Uh, where you find this painted grey ware with the late Harappan. So the, we need more dates uh, to eventually be able to reconstruct all these chronologies and then you know, finally have a, a complete picture of what happened. And the com picture is definitely complex because it's not as if we have only painted grey ware as the early pottery styles in the Ganges. That would be too simple. There are several others. One of them is called OCP or Ochre colored, uh, ochred colored pottery. So it has a ochre or dark yellowish uh, uh, taint. And uh, this is found, this is possibly older as the stratigraphy here suggests, but at other sites it's not so clear, older than painted grey ware. And it is considered now more or less to be a kind of degenerate late Harappan pottery. So all these questions are, I mean, though they may seem a little abstruse for some of you, they are ultimately the questions that you know, uh, allow us to answer the broader questions of chronology and what happens uh, and so on. Copper Horde culture is another culture in the region where surprisingly large caches, hordes of copper tools and implements, uh, weapons also, like the antenna sword I mentioned the other day, uh, which uh, we, we saw an example of it at the Harappan site of Sanoli. And uh, uh, these horns have been found in many sites in North India, also in the Deccan Plateau. Some extends into hundreds of kilograms of tools and, uh, uh, and uh, implements in copper. And we, the, the beauty is that we don't even know who were the authors of it and who were the people burying these uh, massive amounts of, of uh, copper artifacts. But here you see one figure which came out a few years ago at Sonipat in Haryana where uh, very strangely, and now some people have rushed to the conclusion that this was a fake, but I think it's a little hasty. Uh, strangely, you find Brahmi uh, uh, script. These are Brahmi signs. So Brahmi is well understood. This is the language of uh, Ashoka. Uh, the, the, I mean, the, the script that Ashoka the Great was using to communicate in the 3rd century BC in the form of his edicts. And then you have a Harappan unicorn, an animal which has exactly the, the, the horn represented on Harappan seas, almost the same, not quite the same. So could it be uh, some kind of a bridge between late Harappan cultures and uh, copper horde cultures? Well, the question is open. We, if we could only date such an, uh, an, an object, we, could be able, we might be able to answer this question. Later on, there is a different type of pottery called the black polished ware. You see some samples of it. And if you visit a site called Koshambi, uh, not very far from here, before Allahabad, uh, you can actually pick some of them uh, are lying on the top of the uh, ground. You find that this is a very fine 
wear and uh, it, has, uh, the, it is of such fine quality that today the exact manufacturing process has still not been understood. Conventionally, this is the chronology of it from 700 BC and it coincides with the emergence of the cities in the Ganges Plains. Uh, so it is taken to be a marker for the start of urbanism in the Ganges Plains, but recently the date has been pushed back at a few sites. I'll come back to this when we talk about Ayodhya. And this is one again, one of the big question marks about chronology, which will have to be resolved through more excavations. Now, with this um, northern black polished ware, we can leave the world of pottery and come back to something you know we can relate to uh, more directly, which is the, the, the states emerging in the Ganges Valley. Now, this is not very recent. It has been known for quite some time. The earliest states can, that can be distinguished from about 600 BC, but possibly 100 or 200 years earlier, other states called in the uh, uh, Indian literature, the, the late Vedic literature, the Buddhist, the Jain text, the Janapadas. Janapada means a territory basically. But then they organize themselves gradually into Mahajanapadas. And 16 of them are mentioned in Buddhist and Jain texts. You can see them on the map here. And uh, of course, you can uh, readily understand uh, some of the names. Uh, which, which are understandable, Kosala, uh, Panchala, I have mentioned earlier, Kuru, of course, or Kurukshetra, and so on. And Magadha, we will see later. So, uh, this, these are, this is the structure that initially existed. Why are they sometimes called proto republics? Because some of them were actually using assemblies. All of them had assemblies, all of them. But in some of them, the king, the ruler, was not actually hereditary. He was elected by the assembly. And uh, this, uh, this meant that it was a fairly democratic, in the modern sense of the term, process. Uh, but it could also mean some instability, because then you know lobbying would start, and uh, there would be uh, all kinds of uh, pushes and pulls. Uh, these are some of the sites corresponding to the, you can recognize some of them. The nearest to here would be Sheringvirpur, about 100. 50 kilometers from today's Kampu. Jusi, I have mentioned earlier, Koshambi. Uh, uh, Jusi is very close to Allahabad. And you, you can recognize quite a few of them. So these are sites which, uh, which belong to the historical period. And uh, uh, briefly, if I am to summarize what are the important contributions of this Ganga of India civilization, what makes it different, though it may have continuities it does have continuities with the Harappan civilization, as I showed earlier, but it has also innovations. First, of course, is the widespread use of iron technology, emergence of organized states, as I have mentioned now, the presence of uh, warfare, uh, undeniably through uh, archaeological excavations and the texts, of course, uh, and a political integration that will result from warfare. We'll see briefly how. Then the most important phenomenon of the emergence of organized religions, Buddhism and Jainism, then the codification of what will ultimately become known as Hinduism uh, through texts like the, the Upanishads, the, Shastra, the various Shastras, massive literary production, which doesn't mean that it was all written down. In fact, initially much of it, the Vedas in particular, even probably the epics, the two epics initially was not written down. Then uh, a lot of artistic production, which will eventually produce what we can call classical Indian art. Interactions across India, especially with the far south of the peninsula and beyond India, uh, that we will see, in fact, uh, next week in, in some detail. Therefore, the expansion of trade networks and the uh, invention of currency. Invention, well, whether it, it is a local invention or not, we can't say, but currency comes into use in many parts of India. And uh, I said initially, despite wars and conquests, the cultural integration across much of India, but we could reverse the argument and say that it is also thanks to uh, warfare and conquest, because it is true that the, the, the kingdoms 
uh, especially the expanding empires, uh, I'll give you just a quick look at the, the Ashokan, the Mauryan Empire in a moment, uh, did result in political uh, as well as cultural integration. Now, just a minute on the concept of democracy, since I have mentioned it, it is not actually as, as recent as the Mahajanapadas. There are already notions in the Vedas, there are terms like Sabha Samiti, that we can see that communities are used to working together and meeting in assemblies. And uh, as, as I said, in the uh, Mahajanapadas, we have evidence from Buddhist texts. So one Buddhist text, for example, speaks of the Vajji Mahajanapada, which, uh, which had its capital at uh, Vaishali, uh, with something like 7,707 members. It doesn't seem like a very natural number, so we can take it with a pinch of salt, and it would look like a very huge assembly, assembly but uh, certainly there must have been wide assemblies. And uh, the assembly members, interestingly, were called Rajas. Uh, there's another one with 5,000 members. But then, you see, what's interesting is that in uh, one of the Buddhist texts, uh, this concept is actually kind of not exactly opposed, but made fun of. Because <coughs> the, the, the future Buddha is going to be born. And there is a discussion going on in heaven about where should he be born. And someone says that, you know, these um, uh, Lichavis uh, of Vaishalis uh, should be avoided. He should not be born there. Why should he not be born there? Because these people do not speak to each other in the proper manner, do not follow the dharma, do not preserve the ranks of social status. They are talking about the assembly members and age. Do not become anybody's disciples. And each one thing, I am, I am the raja, I am the raja, because the assembly members are called rajas. So uh, this is shown, you know, as, as a kind of a, a chaotic uh, a structure which is not... Uh, uh, the, the desired order and um, therefore this, uh, this experiment was not very widespread and ultimately the hereditary system of monarchy prevailed. Uh, in fact, I was reminded very much of our Lok Sabha when I, I read this description. I don't know <laughs> if you will agree or not, but it looks as if our assemblies have always been a little disorderly. Anyway, so I won't spend time on this because this is all standard history and that's not my purpose, but this is just to show you graphically the expansion of these kingdoms, first from the Magadha kingdom uh, um, uh, in the 6th century BC into the Nanda empire, 5th century BC now, which will in turn be conquered by Chandragupta Maurya, the founder of uh, the Mauryan empire. And you can see here the expansion of the Mauryan Empire from A to B to C, and that means recapturing what Alexander the Great had possessed, to D and E. E is the famous Kalinga battle, which finally saw, if you remember, Ashoka's conversion, because there was so much slaughter, one lakh people, according to his own edict, you know, that he underwent a change of heart and uh, decided to promote peace and the teaching of the dharma, that is to say Buddhism. And you can see that his kingdom uh, expanded all the way uh, to almost uh, south, uh, barring what is today Tamil Nadu and uh, uh, Kerala, with southern parts of Andhra and Karnataka also. Uh, though he knew about them and uh, they, were, they, were, they were actually in relationship, uh, he mentions the, the, the Cholas, the Pandyas, the Kerala Putras in his edits. So, so this, uh, this is, of course, uh, standard history. But then, uh, not long ago, some of his edicts were found not only just in India, uh, but also all the way in Afghanistan. And you see them here uh, in Aram. Uh, they, they are written no longer in Brahmi and uh, uh, Brahmi script with Prakrit language, which is the case all over India, Brahmi script and Prakrit language. But here they are in Aramaic uh, script and language. This, is, this one is from Kandahar. It is said to have been destroyed recently. I'm not been able to get very firm information. Uh, but you have partly uh, Greek and Aramaic because this uh, Central Asia at that time was ruled by dynasties of what 
uh, was later called the Indo-Greeks, that is to say the descendants of uh, you know, the Greeks that Alexander the Great left behind. So uh, it's interesting to see the expansion of uh, Alexander the Great's uh, empire. And um, it was said till recently that he was never portrayed anywhere. Nobody knew what he might have looked like. In fact, there were a few portrayals, but not you know, unambiguously identified, like in Sanchi, uh, there might be one. But recently, a few years ago, in northern Karnataka, northern Karnataka at a place called Kanaga Nahali, uh, you, we, this, uh, this representation, this huge panel, several meters high, made of limestone slab, was found, and there was an inscription in Prakrit which read Rayo Ashok, Ashoka, that is to say King Ashoka. So this was, then he was specifically identified and of course these would be his queens and um, uh, this is uh, in fact a complex uh, Buddhist site which is, uh, which is I think still under excavation. Uh, it was said to be threatened by the submergence uh, uh, resulting from the construction of a dam nearby. I do not know what the latest situation is. It's not very clear. So, well, we have various scenes like these uh, on, uh, the, at these Buddhist sites showing, you know, not only uh, religious life, not only uh, the, 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 the rulers, uh, but also very ordinary human beings and that is what makes them interesting and historians study them more and more. You have scenes like this, you know, the, in fact the other day it was uh, 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 Krishna Sanmashtami and I saw in the paper, I think just when we reached Kampo, uh, a photograph of such a human pyramid here in Kampo and very, very much uh, the same as this one. So this is from, from Barhut in Madhya Pradesh and it would date perhaps 2nd to 3rd century BC. Uh, you have scenes with the uh, public performers of dance and music, scenes of uh, even gamblers, you know, that is also uh, uh, part of the culture. So all these have been now well documented, well identified. I'll just end with a few uh, 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 sites which have been excavated in recent times. This one is Koshambi which I mentioned earlier, it was the capital of uh, uh, Mahajanapada and it showed evidence, the interesting thing here is that it had evidence of uh, warfare in the form of concentrated numbers of arrowheads and a few skeletons at the, the basis of the uh, uh, ramparts which you see here, colossal brick built rampart at Koshambi. In fact, uh, some of us three years ago visited uh, the site and this uh, a few photos uh, we took at that time. This is a remain of an Ashokan pillar. Uh, the edicts were written either on rocks or on such uh, uh, stone columns, monolithic stone columns generally, columns. Uh, this is uh, from Varanasi, some interesting new results coming out. Recent, uh, till recently it was the conventional wisdom about Varanasi was that uh, Rajgat here was the origin of the city, you know, and it was supposed to date back to the 8th or 9th century BC. Uh, today, this is the modern city here today, but there are sites which have been um, uh, uh, studied in, around Varanasi, which are sites like Kotwa here, and especially Akta here. And this has been done by teams from uh, BHU, um, uh, university, the Department of Archaeology, under the direction of Dr. Vidula Jaiswal. And uh, she found here, especially at Akta, uh, dates going well into the second millennium BC. So something like uh, 12, 1300 BC, uh, which uh, pushes back the date of occupation of uh, Varanasi. Of course, this is to the north of the present city, but it would have been in continuous occupation uh, throughout. So, and you have here some iron artifacts and uh, some evidence of uh, various pottery objects. Uh, and, but she, gets some she got some firm dates from her excavations. So this is at Akta. Finally, uh, we will end with a few slides of a very uh, fascinating site in Orissa, which is Shishupalgar, 
Shishu Palgar today is a suburb of Bhuvaneshwa. And the reason why it's so fascinating is that the Gangetic sites do not show very rigorous town planning. You know, they, they, there is town, some town planning. We do have fortifications, but it is not grid-like uh, as we saw, for example, in the Harappan civilization. Uh, in fact, a, a plan for an ideal city has been given by Kotilya in the Arthashastra. And you see here the uh, ramparts, the enclosures with four openings, uh, then, uh, you know, a, a very uh, grid type of planning for the inner city. And this is a moat surrounding the city. Now, something very much like it came to light in the, first of all, in the 1940s, 48, Professor Bibilal excavated first at Shishu Palgar. And you can see here the outline. This is 1.3 kilometers, 1.3 kilometers. It's a huge uh, city, but it has not one like here, but two openings. There is a moat. This is the relic of the moat. Water is still flowing into it. You can see it goes, it's a bit irregular nowadays. And uh, massive gateways and a, a lot of streets, which unfortunately the site now, as you can see, is very much encroached upon, though it is technically a uh, 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 protected site by the <coughs> uh, Archaeological Survey of India, uh, the uh, ASI failed to acquire the land, which it could easily have done in the 1940s because it was all agricultural land, and the, therefore the land is private, all of it is private still today, and people still just start building, and there is no real authority to stop them from doing so. So the, the site is actually getting lost, but recently, <coughs> this is a view from the 1948 excavations. Enormous gateway, you can see the moat outside. This is towards the city. And this narrowed entrance is to, with the sentinel room on the side, which looks very much like what we saw at Dholavira, the same kind of uh, pattern, is to basically control the movement of people in and out. <coughs> so these are some of the views which uh, we took uh, recently when we visited a few years ago. And uh, uh, with the, at the center of the city, uh, beautiful laterite pillars, which would have you know, supported a superstructure here. Uh, the excavations recently have shown all kinds of uh, uh, structures, but unfortunately they are on too small a scale to give us an entire layout map of the city. Uh, but you can see uh, uh, some of the brick-built uh, structures which were uh, there. Different techniques like geophysical survey where you measure the soil's resistivity by planting electrodes into the soil uh, were used to actually detect some anomalies not visible from the ground surface like this uh, uh, street here. Uh, and this is the palace structure. <coughs> so this gives uh, very useful clues to archaeologists as to where to excavate. And this is, these are some of the pillars I showed you earlier, but then you see all of these came to light. So I think altogether, I forget the exact number now, but it runs into something like 30 pillar bases, which give a kind of a layout like this. Very interesting upsidal or semi-elliptic shape, which I will come back to in a future lecture. It was initially thought to be a palace, but current thinking of the Archaeologist uh, Professor R.K. Mohanty of Deccan College and Monica Smith from uh, Californian uh, Institute of Archaeology. Um, uh, the thinking is that perhaps it might be a temple rather than a palace. The, the verdict is still not out. Now, finally, what is very fascinating, and this is quite unique, I believe, it's, though it's not in the Ganges Plains, it is part of the Ganges civilization very much. The, the period is the same. We are talking about something like three to 500 BC for these cities. And what's fascinating here is that the same layout which Kautilya gives uh, specifically in the Arthashastra is found replicated at, at, at least three or four uh, sites, historical sites in the region within, I think, 100 or 150 kilometers from Bhubaneswar, from Shishu Palgar. Here you see another one <coughs> which is a little smaller, so therefore. Uh, they have provided only one entrance, which is what uh, Kotilia also mentioned, in fact, one entrance into the city. But then the site has only been surveyed. It has not been uh, uh, excavated yet. A few trenches, though, were taken uh, at these locations. 
Uh, I'm not showing you in great detail because there would be too much, but then you see another one. This is Lati in Berampur, where again we have the same, and you see how uh, identically patterned those gateways have been made. So uh, it's very clear here that uh, there must have been a powerful state, and it could be the Kalinga state, but this will be known only after detailed chronological study, uh, imposing a, a a layout uh, of town planning over several cities, and there could be many more of them. So this, is, this was just a fairly rapid survey of a new finding in the uh, Ganges Plains, or Gangavindya civilization, as it is called now. And again, you can see that um, uh, we need always new techniques of investigations uh, to bring up new evidence. But then it shows that this was really a major nucleus of Indian civilization after the collapse of the Harappan civilization. And it is from this region that you know the rest of India was gradually urbanized, both back towards the Indus, towards the south, towards the east, and, uh, and uh, uh, the whole Deccan Plateau, ultimately. Thank you. <laughs>